Well, good morning. And today is an exciting day here at Bridgepoint. It is Life Group Sunday. I know you probably noticed there's a bunch of us wearing the same shirt, and that's not because we accidentally matched. Have you, is there anything more embarrassing than showing up somewhere and realizing you look exactly like your spouse? Last night, uh, my wife and I, we went to a friend's house for dinner, and as we're walking in the door, realized we have the same color shirt, same color jeans, our shoes are matching. We look like we were taking family pictures together. Okay, but that's not what's going on here today. Um, actually, all of us wearing these shirts. We are leading life groups this semester. And if you're newer to Bridgepoint and wonder, well, what the heck is a life group? Well, life groups are small groups of people that meet together all throughout the community, different days, different times, really with two purposes in mind. The first one is that meeting in groups together really helps us grow to be more like Jesus. Like if we follow Jesus, we want to look more like him. And I think sometimes the things that we say um, start to give us uh, the wrong impression of what following Jesus is like. There's this really popular phrase, a personal relationship with Jesus. And I do believe he wants that relationship. But then sometimes you think, well, all I need is my personal relationship with Jesus. So me and Jesus, we're going to conquer the world. But the reality is, when we actually open up scripture, it says that we cannot become like Jesus on our own. We need a community of other people who are helping us look more like him. I know in my life, I need people who will call me out on maybe some bitterness that I'm hanging on to, or man, Matt, I don't think you approach that situation in a very loving way. I need people who will encourage me when I go through difficult times and people who will go out and celebrate with me when things are going well. And we need each other if we're going to look more like Jesus. But the second reason life groups are so important is because all of us, we need friends. Like we need community. I think two of the greatest needs that we have is people want to be needed and people want to be known. And by the way, even a church the size of Bridgepoint, it is so easy to come in on Sunday mornings and sing some songs and sit down, listen to the message and just leave. And and you don't have to feel needed. Nobody has to know you. I mean, that can be a very isolating place. And so where I think life change really happens is not when we're sitting in a room like this, but when we're sitting around a dinner table together, we're sitting in a living room and opening up and sharing life. And that's my heart for each and every person here. I've said it for years. If you have to choose between being in a life group and being at church on Sunday morning, be in a group. Because actually groups look a lot more like the church we're going to read about here today than what this setting right here looks like. So in just a minute, you're going to get a chance to have some good food. You'll get a chance to go around and explore the different life groups we have this semester. But before we do that, uh, we're going to jump back into the series we started last week, looking at Paul's letter to the Romans. And this series is going to go on for several weeks still to go. So if you're new, you're just hopping in here, that you're right where you need to be. Now, if you need to go back, uh, last week we did a lot of the context and introduction, and we don't have time to go back over that again. And some of you are like, thank goodness, because that was a slog last week. So if you want all that, you can check out our YouTube channel or our podcast and get caught up. But today we're really going to get into the heart of what this letter is all about. And I think we have to keep in mind that Romans was not a book, all right? It was not like a theological textbook that was handed to Christians. It wasn't like Paul saying, here's all the the right theology you have to have so you can check all the boxes and believe all the right things. Now, remember, this is a letter written by the early Christian leader, Paul, to a network of five house churches in Rome. So these are are churches that are meeting in homes, much like our life groups. The size is about 20 to 40 people. Most of them are probably at 30 or less people, which is crazy to think about that the Roman church was roughly the same size as Bridgepoint. And they got this letter that's been influential throughout the centuries. And Paul's writing it because this church has become so bitterly divided, they're on the brinks of folding. And, and man, he looks at this and he sees the division and he writes this letter to urge them to pursue unity in Jesus. Now, what was this division that was going on? Well, when these house churches first started, they were started by Jewish followers of Jesus. Now, remember, Judaism is not just a faith. That's an ethnicity. That's an identity marker. And so these Jewish Christians grew up hearing the stories from the Jewish scriptures and the Jewish faith. And they did things like they practiced the Sabbath and they ate kosher. They practiced circumcision. And all these things were very important in establishing a Jewish identity. So when they started following Jesus, they continued to practice those 
these things. Now, there were certainly some non-Jewish or some Gentile Christians that were a part of the church, but all the leadership was primarily these Jewish Christians. Well, during the reign of the Roman emperor Claudius, he gets so frustrated with the Jewish people, he kicks them out of Rome. And so when the Jewish people have to leave, who's left in charge of these house churches? The Gentiles, right? The non-Jewish people. And the Gentiles, they don't have the history of knowing the stories and the scripture and, and all the customs and practices. So none of that stuff is important to them. And so they just kind of leave that out of their church practice. And so the churches start to take on a very non-Jewish kind of culture. Well, five years later, these Jewish Christians are allowed to return back to Rome. And when they get there, it feels like someone's hijacked their church because everything has completely changed. And so they're coming in and they're frustrated because no one's practicing these practices. No, no one's doing this stuff. Like, like, guys, don't you read scripture? Don't you know what you're supposed to do? And so these group of Christians, these Jewish Christians, actually start to judge the Gentile Christians, saying you don't take scripture seriously, like you're too progressive, you're leaving stuff behind. Like, like I don't even know if you're actually following Jesus. And then the Gentile Christians get upset and they're in the positions of leadership now and say, who do you think you are to come here and criticize us? Like you're just holding on to old ways. Don't you know Jesus put all that stuff aside? You need to stop following those practices. And this isn't just merely a theological debate. I mean, the, the Gentile Christians were actually using their power and privilege to manipulate and to really like turn the screws into the Jewish Christians. So back in that time, when you had communion, it was a full meal. And so you would come together, you would sit around the table, and the Gentile Christians started serving non-kosher food. You show up and they're having barbecue for dinner, which sounds great to me, but then the Jewish Christians there, they couldn't eat that. They couldn't touch it. And so this meal that was supposed to be something that unified the church, you have half of the people are standing on the wall excluded from participating in the church, and the other half are using their power and privilege to maintain status. And so you have this division that is about to split the church. And so Paul writes this letter to urge them towards unity, and he actually labels these two groups, the weak and the strong. The Jewish Christians he labels as weak, not because they're theologically weak or because they're, you know, they're, they're not strong enough mentally. No, it's because they literally don't have positions of power in the church. And so they're judging these other Christians. And he calls the Gentile Christians the strong because they're the ones who are sitting in power positions of leadership and authority. Does this make sense? Because we have to understand that because last week was the introduction. This week, Paul really is going to start straight in to how are we going to unify this church. Now, one other thing we have to understand if we're going to understand what Paul is talking about, because he's going to start today by talking to that group of, of what he calls weak Christians. He's going to be talking to these Jewish Christians. And so we have to understand how the Jewish people viewed the history of the world. And so they knew their scriptures. They knew that Genesis 1 talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. And when he created the earth, he carved out a section um, that was really heaven on earth. I mean, it was good. It was teeming with life. There was an abundance. It was in a garden called Eden. And there was more than anything that anyone could ever want. And in this garden, God places Adam and Eve, and he calls them to be his images, and we've talked about this a number of times. This doesn't mean that Adam and Eve looked like God, but they acted like God. They did the things that God did. Wherever there was disorder, they brought order. Wherever there was brokenness, they brought healing and wholeness. And they were tasked with continuing the work that God was doing in the world. By the way, the Bible says that that's what it means to work for God's glory, is to do the things that he does, which is, is helpful to me because I kind of grew up in, in, in a kind of a culture where it's like, everything we do, we do it for the glory of God. And we're in the NFL playoffs right now. And they, every player in the interview, like, hey, what does it mean to you that you won? Oh, all glory goes to God. It's all for the glory of God. I'm like, so does living for God's glory mean I need to win the divisional matchup in the NFL? Or like, what does living for his glory mean? Well, it means anywhere there's brokenness, anywhere we see poverty, homelessness, anywhere we see divorce or sickness, we work to bring healing, restoration to meet those needs. We work to bring heaven to earth. That's what it means to live for God's glory. Does that make sense? Now, we know that Adam and Eve didn't image God. They didn't live for his glory. They decided to image themselves and to live for their own glory. 
And in the subsequent chapters of the Bible, like things spiral out of control. There's all this deceit and murder and everything. In fact, you get to Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. It says that the, the people conspired together to build this tower for their own glory, like for their own name's sake. Like this is people have completely turned against God. We're just doing everything for ourselves. So to solve this problem, God comes to a man named Abram and says, if you trust me and follow me, I'll bless your descendants. And they'll be this mighty nation. They become the nation of Israel. And by the way, God chose Israel not saying, hey, I'm going to save you and the rest of the world can go to hell. But he says, I want to bless the world through you. I want you to be a light to the world. So you show the world what heaven on earth looks like. And you work for the glory of God and you image him. And then the rest of the nations will be drawn to it like a moth to a flame. But just like Adam and Eve failed in that calling, Israel did as well. And for hundreds of years, they decided we don't want to do that. We want to pursue our own comfort and our own wealth and our own prosperity. And so they kind of turn their backs and God says, well, I'm not going to force this on you. He removes his protection, and the Israelites are defeated by their enemies. And so all of a sudden, they're living under enemy impression. They're no longer free people. They no longer are the light to the nations. And there's really these questions that emerge like, well, is this whole thing, is this all that's ever going to be? And so the prophets come on to the scene, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah, and they talk about how God's going to do a new thing. There's going to be a new creation. He's going to fix everything. And so I say all that to set this up because this morning I brought some charts with me. All right, who loves a good chart? Anybody? All right, a few of you, a few of you. All right, I'm a visual learner. These help me. Anybody grow up with like end times charts? Okay, this is not going to be anything like that. All right, just to calm any nerves here this morning. But I just want you to see how the Jewish people understood history as it unfolds. So we got the first picture here. They viewed that the world was kind of set up into two phases. The first one would be this present age which is now, by the way. Okay, it's like not the most creative title in the world. But this present age is marked by sin and chaos and disorder and death. And one way we know we're living in that is because the Israelites viewed their captivity and subjugation as part of this present age. And if you read the prophets, they look forward to the day of the Lord. Then this would be uh, the day where God would judge this present age. He would judge all the sin and all the disorder and all the death. And it would be marked by a resurrection of all the good, faithful Jewish people who would then get to enter into the final age, which was called new creation, the kingdom of God, and eternal life. Like these are all phrases used to describe that age, and it's marked not by sin, chaos, disorder, and death, but by righteousness, wholeness, peace, and life. So you kind of see two different eras, and we live in this present age. We're looking forward to new creation. Does this make sense? Yes? No? All right. If you have questions, Mr. Key's got the microphone. He'll come around. Just feel free to raise your hand. It's important that we understand this. By the way, this is why people were so frustrated with Jesus. I've always wanted to do a series called Disappointed by Jesus, because if you read the Gospels, people are just disappointed with Jesus all the time. Jesus said, I've come that you may have eternal life. I've cut, the kingdom of God is here. He's saying, listen, this is going to happen. But instead of Jesus bringing about God's judgment on, on the, the enemies of Israel, instead of liberating them, instead of ushering this age in, he dies. Oh, what kind of savior does that? That doesn't make any sense at all. But for Paul, he understood this in a whole new light. He has this radical encounter with Jesus that changes the way he sees everything. So Paul still sees that, that there is this present age but that everything changed with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And at that moment, new creation and eternal life burst into this world. But we also can look around at the world and say there's still some brokenness, right? There's, there's still homelessness and poverty and all that. It's not fixed. And so there's a sense in which new creation and old creation are coexisting, but that one day Jesus would come back and then at that point he would end old creation once and for all and only new creation would remain. And so right now we're kind of living in between the times and the overlap of new creation and old creation. Is everybody still with me? Because I got one more slide to show you. All right, next one. This one's my favorite. Next one. This is the way I like to think about it. You guys know I love me a good Venn diagram, right? That's my love language. If I'm going to get a tattoo one day, I'm not cool enough to, but it would be a Venn diagram. 
So you have old creation marked by sin, chaos, disorder, division, death. And then we have this new creation that's bursting into the world full of peace and healing, wholeness, unity, and life. But right now, it's like you are here. This is the mall directory. We're right here in the overlap between new creation and old creation. And so we're trying to see, we want to become like Jesus, not just because that's what good moral people do, is because we want to find ourselves a new creation because one day old creation's gone. And if we're still in old creation, we ain't going to be around for new creation. So we're trying to be transformed so that we find ourselves experiencing new creation, eternal life in the kingdom of God. Is this helpful to anybody? All right, because we have to keep all that in mind when we jump in now to Romans chapter one, verse 18. All right, and I messed up on the slides. I put the slides together. I don't have verse 18. So hopefully you have your Bible with you. Otherwise you can jump into verse 20 when we get there. Chapter one, verse 18. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. And as a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. It's a lot to unpack in there, all right? So we're not going to hit every single word in there, but I find it interesting that when Paul, okay, so keep in mind, he is addressing the weak, the Jewish Christians, And he starts off and he says, we know that God's wrath is being revealed among those who are unrighteous and the godless. He's talking about Gentiles. In fact, a lot of this language, Paul actually borrows from other ancient Jewish literature, like the wisdom of Solomon. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to work up these weak Christians to say, amen, brother Paul. Amen. We know those Gentiles, those Gentiles who are lording it over us right now. We know that they're unrighteous. We know that they're godless. And it says that God's wrath is being revealed. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of grew up with this picture of God's wrath, that God was like angry and wrathful and he was going to pour out his vengeance and he was going to destroy people. And even in school, you read stuff like sinners in the hands of an angry God. And this is the picture of God's wrath that we get. But the problem is that's not the way the Bible talks about God's wrath. Because if it was just this punishment that was being doled out, he says, wrath is being revealed for all unrighteous and all those who are ungodly. I don't know about you, but I know some people who probably qualify as ungodly and unrighteous, and there ain't no wrath being poured out on them, at least not apparently. Like I know people who maybe um, have been creative with their business finances so that they can personally prosper. I know people who have um, uh, not uh, lived exemplary lives, but everything seems to go great for them. I know people who have smoked and drank every day of their life. They've lived to 172. And then you have a 20-year-old who's fit and healthy and exercises and eats right, and then they get cancer. Like, listen, if, if God is pouring out his punishment, sometimes it seems like it's headed on the wrong people. And so what Paul's saying here, though, is not like God is actively punishing and judging and pouring out wrath. It's that God's wrath is being revealed. See, in in a Jewish understanding, sin and death are not things that happen. They're like cosmic actors in the world. Like these are forces at work, which I know might weird you out. I'm not saying you got to agree with it. I'm just presenting a Jewish understanding of it. And in the same way, wrath is something that's at work in the world. And wrath consumes and it destroys. And it's seen as this self-consuming force that one day even wrath will destroy itself. And so if you find yourself an old creation, God's wrath is just that everything is getting consumed, left to its own devices. It will be, Revelation says even death will be destroyed in the end. And so what Paul's saying here is, hey, we know that there's these Gentiles who are living old creation and they're on their way to destruction because they're godless, they're unrighteous. And listen, they should know better because sure they didn't get Torah, but God's revealed himself in nature. And yet instead of following God and imaging him, they decided to worship images of these other things, these reptiles and animals. 
And I know it's impossible for us to understand that people would worship animals like falcons and hawks and bulldogs and that's so backwards, right? We would never worship those things. But for Paul's day, as they would walk around Rome, there would be temples. And outside the temples to whatever God, there'd be these statues of different creatures. It was very obvious. The Gentiles worship those gods. And because of that, God's wrath will consume them. They're going to be judged. Listen, new creation is here, but we know that they're not a part of it. They're a part of old creation. They're going to suffer the consequences. Again, remember what Paul, Paul is saying this. He's trying to, amen, brother Paul, preach it. He's talking to you over there. He continues on in his argument, verse 24. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. This is therefore God gave them over. This is actually a perfect picture of what wrath is. Wrath is not God like bringing his thumb down on you. It's saying here, that's what you want. Have it. Follow your desires. Whatever you want. My wife and I were having a conversation this week about how sometimes, I don't know how it is for other people, but sometimes, do you ever have this feeling like, hey, things are going so good in life, something bad's probably about to happen. You know, we kind of worry the other shoe's about to drop. Now, at the same time with my, some, some men that I'm in a discipleship group with, we're reading through all the Gospels in 30 days. So we're in Luke right now. And it's been convicting because like every other chapter in Luke, Luke Jesus is like, uh, if you want to follow me, you have to renounce your possessions. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. Just like hammering on possessions. And I had this thought and I said to Bethany, what if things aren't going so well that something bad's about to happen? What if things going so well is the bad thing that's happening? Because all of a sudden we don't have to trust in God. All of a sudden we don't have to take these great leaps of faith. What if, what if really punishment is just getting everything you ever wanted? And then realizing that none of that's anything you need. Find yourself enslaved to materialism, to work, relationships, whatever it is. God's wrath is just handing them over. And when he hands them over, he talks about how now they're engaging in sexual impurities and, and they're, they're worshiping the created things instead of the creator. Again, he says they, they exchange the truth for a lie. The truth is we're supposed to be the images of God. The lie is that we really want to have these other images instead. Again, amen, Brother Paul. We see his sexual impurities. Amen. The, the Gentiles are guilty. He continues on, verse 26. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their, woman exchange, their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men, in the same way, also left natural relationships with women and were inflamed in their lust to one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. Now, these verses here, I mean, these, these are sometimes called clobber verses because we want to take these and say, right here, look. Paul's preaching against homosexuality and same-sex relationships. Now, there's a lot of debate in the scholarly community. Are these mutual loving relationships? Is this some kind of uh, situation where there's manipulation and, and stuff involved? But we, we can have those conversations. But remember, this is all in the context of Paul is trying to get the weak to say, yes, look at these other people. They're a part of the line of people where there's same-sex attraction and, and action. Look at that. I mean, those people should be judged. Amen, Paul. Let's get after it. He's preaching preaching against them now. And then he continues on. Verse 28. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind, so they do what is not right. So he gave them over to their desires. He gave them over to their bodies. He gave them over to their minds. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. That one doesn't seem to fit. Senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. And although they know God's just sentence and that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. So Paul gives this whole long list of things. And he says that these are acts of unrighteousness. 
Now, this is where translating from Greek into English really doesn't help us a whole lot because the Greek word here is adikia. And really, it's the same word for, for unrighteousness and injustice. It's so actually the, the same Greek word is used for righteousness and justice, and you put an A, like adikia, and it means unrighteousness or injustice. And this is unhelpful in the English language because for many of us, we think of righteousness as like my personal standing before God. It's my personal relationship. I want to be holy. I want to be clean. But justice, justice relates to other people, right? Like we see an injustice over there, and we want to fix it. We see something has gone wrong over here, and we want to address that need. Well, see, for Paul, it's one and the same. He's not saying like, these are people who are just messed up. These are people who are causing injustice to happen to other people. All of those things he lists are ways you relate to other people. They're slandering. They're gossiping. They're malicious. They're disobedient to parents. It's all interactions with one another. He says, here's all of this division has come about because those Gentiles have been handed over to all of their desires. And it says that not only do they do them, but they applaud other people who do them, which by the way, I think is a challenging word for us. And here's where I'm, I'm more than happy to step on some toes because I'm not old, but I'm old enough to remember that Christians during Bill Clinton's presidency and Donald Trump's presidency said the same thing. So I bring that up because of both sides of the aisle here. Well, we're not electing a pastor in chief. See, I find that interesting because I think that the point that Paul is making here is not only are you doing them, you're applauding other people who do them. And a lot of times when it comes to the way we relate to people in power, and by the way, this could be politics, this could be pastors, that, well, hey, listen, they might not be like a person of high moral character, but are going to get the job done. They're going to appoint the right people in positions of power. Listen, that pastor might be abusive, but man, their church is growing. And what we say is, well, the ends justify the means. Listen, for Christians, the ends never justify the means because for God, the ends and the means have equal value. See, in the Old Testament, God told Israel, do not marry people of other nations. And it's not because God's a racist. It's because in that culture, marrying people of other nations is how you would establish treaties. And God told them, I don't want you to establish treaties. I want you to trust me. And instead, the Israelites say, well, God wants us to be safe. He wants us to be secure. So I know he said not to do that, but we're just going to be safe. And that's what God wants. And so they marry other nations And as a result, they drift away from God. Because for God, it's not just about getting from point A to point B. It's about going from person A to person B. And the means matter. Like how many times do you hear people say, well, God wants me to be happy, right? So I do whatever it takes to be happy. And all of a sudden for us, the ends justify the means. And for Paul, for the writers of scripture, for Jesus, that can never be the case. So let's track where we are in Paul's argument. He's talking to the Jewish Christians. All right, we know God's wrath is going to come on these Gentile Christians because they're part of old creation. They didn't acknowledge God that they should have, but their their ancestors worshiped all these other idols, all these other reptiles and animals and everything else. They've been given over to sexual impurity. They're engaging in same-sex relationship. They're full of malice, slander, evil of all kinds. Like, like this is who they are. And you can just hear the week going, yes, that's what we've been trying to say, Paul. That's who they are and why they should not be in positions of power. And it's all of that to get us to Romans chapter 2, verse 1, where Paul says, Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself since you, the judge, do the same things. This is huge because what Paul is saying is when you judge, you're just as guilty. You've done those same things. And not only that, but when you judge, you're causing the same kind of division that all those other acts caused. The word judge here in Greek is the word krino. And certainly we should judge, right? We should judge, hey, this is a good thing and this is a bad thing. That's not what this kind of judgment is. This is the kind of judgment that says, no, I am a good person and you are a bad person. I am following Jesus faithfully and you are not. I am doing all the right things and you are not. And Paul says, when that is your attitude towards other followers of Jesus, you are just as guilty as the people you are judging. You have caused that same division and separation as they have. You are not any better than they are. Which, by the way, 
huge point because some of those verses in chapter one get plucked out to do the very thing that Paul is saying not to do. Say, oh, look, Paul says right here, I'm better than you. You're not a faithful Christian. This is not the kind of life you should live. And I wonder if Paul would be like, you totally missed the point of that. Don't do it. Don't judge. You are not better than them. He continues in verse two. We know that God's judgment is on those who do such thing is based on the truth. And remember, we just talked about they exchanged the truth for a lie. The truth was we are supposed to serve our creator and not the created things. He's saying the judgment that we receive from God is not based on like, like all right, God's super holy and you're, you made one mistake. No, the judgment comes because the truth is we're supposed to image God. And in what areas of our life are we imaging other things? That's where God's judgment comes into play. And it doesn't matter if you're a part of the weak or the strong. None of you have been acting like the image of God. He continues on verse three. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. And he's saying, listen, you're living in between the times, right? Remember our diagram? You are here. Like, don't you understand that when you're living between the times, like the reason that God hasn't come in full yet, the reason old creation is still here is because there's some old creation that has to be removed from all of us. And it's God's kindness and waiting so that he can help us step into new creation kind of living. Does this make sense? So he's saying you can't judge other people because God's still working on them. And in the same way, when you judge, you're not even in the middle. You're still standing in old creation. Like you're storing up wrath for yourself. You've at, you think that you're moving into new creation and you've actually just moved yourself back into the old way of doing things. So you cannot get new creation results with old creation tactics. You are not going to judge people into looking more like Jesus. You cannot condemn people into becoming more like Jesus. You cannot yell, argue, debate, scream, ostracize people into looking more like Jesus. But when you do those things, you find yourself an old creation and all the consequences that come with it. Verse six, he will repay each one according to his faith. Nope, doesn't say that. He will repay each one according to his prayer life. Oh, it doesn't say that. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory. How do we live for the glory of God? By being his image in the world, the glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness or injustice. It's hard to get this picture based on the way the Greek translates into English. But Paul's painting this picture. We all start an old creation. And when you're an old creation, he's going to judge each one according to, how do you live your life? Are you pursuing new creation? Listen, not, not are you perfect? Not have you been complete change? But if you're pursuing it, then God will gift you eternal life. But if you stay over here, it's not that God's going to like send you, like punish you over here. God's going to let you reap the natural consequences of your actions when you're self-seeking, when you cause division and injustice. Does this make sense? This is so important because I think a lot of times what we've boiled down to, well, I'm good because when I was eight years old, I said a prayer at vacation Bible school. Or when I was 16, I went to summer camp and man, it was awesome. We raised our hands and I followed Jesus. But then you came back home and you started smoking pot and getting drunk and sleeping with your boyfriend and girlfriend and cussing like a sailor. And there's no life change. Or it's like, hey, a few years ago, I got baptized at Bridgepoint, but you're still looking at porn every night and you're not doing the things you're supposed to do. It's not like I prayed a prayer and now I'm in new creation. It's listen, I love Jesus. And now I give my entire life in pursuit of becoming more like him. That's what new creation looks like. And when we reduce it to this personal salvation, I pray to prayer, we do so much injustice. And oftentimes what we find is, well, I said a prayer, I'm good. So now I get to sit in judgment over you. It's about your whole life. Are we working to be the images of God? 
verse 9 says, There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for there is no favoritism with God. In other words, God doesn't show partiality. Just because you showed up to church every week, just because you grew up in a Christian home, just because you gave a lot of money. Listen, for God, there's nobody too big or too important that we have to sweep everything under the rug. Listen, the fact that God shows no impartiality, that's good news for people who've been marginalized, and that's bad news for those of us who sit in positions of power and privilege, because that power and privilege doesn't do you anything. Now, I've got to be honest with you. That's not where I wanted to end the message. That's kind of a downer, right? Like, hey, Paul's saying, hey, you're all unified because you're all in the same boat together. Now, next week, we're going to get into chapter three, and I want to do it today, but I don't think you want to sit here for 45 more minutes while we unpack chapter three. Chapter three is going to be so, so good. And I literally, like, I could preach it right now. I've already got it ready to go because I was like, we can't end there. But here's where I kind of want to turn this and hopefully give this uh, kind of a, a spin of hope on it. Because the idea in our culture is that if there are differences, then there should be divisions. Right? We live in a polarized culture. And polarized just means that we all decided to stay with people who looked, act, think, and believe like us. And it would have been really easy for Paul, right, to say, you know what, all this fighting, let's just let's split the churches. Let's say we'll give three of them to the Jewish Christians and two of them to the Gentile Christians. Is that fair? And we'll just split up, just be around the people who looked, act, think, believe like you. And by the way, we live in a culture where that's kind of how we approach it. Because we live in a culture, you don't have to do anything that makes you uncomfortable. So you're at church, and you're in a life group, and somebody says something that in all fairness they probably shouldn't have said. And it hurt you, it wounded you. I'm done. Not going back there. Pastor says something you didn't agree with. That's fine. I'll just find a church where I do agree with it. That friend stabbed you in the back. That's fine. I'll just find new friends. That job didn't reward you the way you thought you should have been rewarded. That's fine. I'll find a new job. We don't have to sit in the discomfort. And so many of us have spent our entire lives avoiding people who are different than us. And the reality is that if we're going to faithfully follow Jesus, it's actually by being with people who are different that we show the world that Jesus is different. Like that's how we show the world what heaven on earth looks like. Listen, I'm here to tell you that in just a minute, you're going to get to explore life groups. And hey, can I be honest? Like, I want to be like very honest, and hopefully you don't judge me because I just preached against not judging people. But I really just did, did all that just so you wouldn't judge me here. No, that's not. When I lead a life group, I promise you, like this is just your fleshly part of me. I'm nervous who's going to sign up for my group. Am I going to get somebody who's weird? Just being honest. The person who talks too much. Am I going to person who makes me uncomfortable, the person who wants to talk about their political views in the first five minutes of the first meeting, you know? I mean, listen, I always tell people, it's like, I was friends with some of you until I followed you on Facebook, and now I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't want you in my group. That's just, a, that's the part of me, because being around people who are different is hard, but actually it's being around people who are different that starts to transform us and make us into new creation, that starts to make us into the people God wants us to be. And in just a moment, you're going to get a chance to explore the different groups. And I know how it is because we have some fun groups. We have like a knitting group and hobby groups and softball group. We got a lot of that are around like fun, common things to do. Then we have like Bible study groups. It's like, oh, I really want to do this kind of study. And that's, that's a valid way to pick a group. But I wonder if maybe for some of us, if we listen close enough, the Holy Spirit might be asking you to join a group that you wouldn't normally join because you know you need to be around people who are different than you, people who are in a different stage of life, people who are older, people who are younger, people with different political views or theological views, because it's when we're around people who we're different from that that kind of unity transforms us, transforms our church, and makes us a light to the community. Does that make sense? And so I had these like nice, I don't have time for questions, guys. Just send in questions. I'll try to take extra time next week. And I had these nice little points I wanted to make at the end about, uh, stay committed to Jesus and others. But really, what I just feel like in this moment, just we got to stay committed to community. We can't let these things divide us. 
We cannot take the easy path. We need to follow the path of Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you some important communion instructions. Because if you're like me, I can smell all the amazing food that's around. Communion is not around the outside today. That's some food for in a minute. Communion is up here at the front. So in a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you up for communion. And as you come forward, I just want you to ask Jesus. Jesus, reveal to me the group you want me in, not the one I want to be in. Reveal to me the community I need in my life so that I can become more like you. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Jesus, we're just so thankful. We're thankful in an odd way that all of us are in this boat together. But I'm also thankful that you came to bring about eternal life and new creation. And that regardless of our history and our background and our differences, we all have access to that by your death and resurrection. And I pray right now, in this moment, that when we're tempted to push people who are different away, when we're tempted to sit in judgment, we would remember your words to address the plank in our own eye before we address the speck in someone else's. Help us to be humble. Help us to take a posture of learning and serving. And I just pray over this life group semester. I pray as you bring different people together, that there would be such unity and growth. Your spirit would just meet us here that when people at our work or in our family or in our neighborhood hear about the stuff that we're doing, they're like, how does that even work? Because we don't want to look like the world. We want to look like heaven on earth. So Jesus, would you speak to us, guide us to the group you want us to be in, shape us and change us to be more like you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. As you feel led, you can take communion.